it's Chelsea for her tireless efforts in getting this webinar series up and running. It takes a lot of effort and energy and coordination and and patience. And I think that's probably one of Chelsea's major strengths. This afternoon, we're going to talk about guava root knot nematode, one of the one of the four major plant parasitic root knot nematodes. And what you're looking at on, on the screen is the galled root system of a cucumber plant. But before launching into the presentation, I would just like to make an acknowledgement to country, acknowledging the traditional owners, the Larrakia people. And we pay our respects to their culture and their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, this afternoon, just going to give you some background to this polyphagous plant parasitic uh, nematode, the impact it has on plant health, its host list, which creates a lot of challenges because of how large its host list is, our current and future foci, and of course the, the village or the team that have helped enable us to not only be able to characterise this uh, nematode, but also to give us a starting point to document the nematode fauna in cropping areas of the Northern Territory. There's a couple of our, a couple of my team members. Um, Sam Bond um, is probably our, our nematologist and standing with his back to us is Charles Mintoff. Um, so it happened in October 2022 that guava root knot nematode was detected in cucumber plants from a vegetable farm in Middle Point. Um, there was some fall armyworm surveys going on and um, these plant samples were brought in off some uh, off cucumber under fruit load showing severe wilting symptoms. We had a look at the nematodes very carefully and discovered that it was uh, Melodogyne enterolobii. This nematode has not been previously reported in Australia, but we must point out that other related species were assumed to be present in the Northern Territory. And these are other root knot nematode species. And the two that had been previously recorded, say before the year 2000, were Melodogyne javanica and Melodogyne incognita. Um, so you just see a picture of a uh, rural, Dar uh, rural uh, Darwin and the Darwin rural region. You'll see middle point circled in yellow, but I've also highlighted a little circle in Darwin uh, because oops, when we made the discovery, we we're also able to do some retros retrospective analyses. So with previous root, uh, root knot nematode samples that we'd recovered in the, say, the previous two years, we keep the DNA that we extract from the individual females. And these, this DNA extract was frozen and sitting in our collection. When we went back and ran a subsequent sa a sample, a retrospective sample from Malak from 2021, we discovered that um, guava root knot nematode was actually present in the suburbs of Darwin in 2021 and it remained undiagnosed until we picked it up in October of 22. And then as we did follow-up surveillance of household, community gardens, we found that guava root knot nematode was widely distributed in the Darwin and Darwin rural area. And of course, we advised the Commonwealth Consultative Emergency Plant Pest Committee on our discoveries on the spatial distribution, the historical uh, records, and the host list, which includes non-target colonizations of weeds, and was came to the conclusion that it was not technically feasible to eradicate this nematode. So just a little background about this Melodogyne enterolobii. Enterolobii um, goes back to the, uh, the earpod tree, 
um, enterolobium, uh, where, which was found to be the type uh, that the type specimen was associated. This discovery was made in 1983, uh, but up to that point, root knot nematodes that were considered to be Melodogyne incognita may also have been Melodogyne enterolobii. I hope I haven't confused anyone there, um, but the, uh, the, the identification of these uh, nematodes is based on morph was based on morphology, and the morphology really requires a specialist to be able to make the differences. And so, um, potentially, some of the um, root knot nematode samples that we got had been misdiagnosed because we didn't have access to this particular um, type specimen or the PCR to give us this particular um, identity. But the other major root knot nematodes which are problematic in the world are Arenaria, Melodogyne incognita javanica and Melodogyne hapla. But of course the fifth guy, the fifth on the block now is Melodogyne enterolobii. And just to, um, as, a, as an aside, the, that ear pod tree is a common street tree in Darwin, which is the type host. We went back and had a look at some of our historical records um, prior to 2000. And when we looked at our database, we had a total of 37 records. Is that correct? 36 records. Oh, sorry, 37 records. 29 were identified as Melodogyne species. Three were confirmed as Incognita and five as Javanica. And as I said previously, these identifications were based on morphology, but if the morphology wasn't available, we probably would have tended to group the root knot nematode according to the host association that we found. And so some of those may have been incorrect. So as I mentioned, when it comes to the taxonomy of these organisms, it is very, very difficult to differentiate them. So I've given you an example of the posterior end of three female samples within Melodogyne enterolobii. And when you look at the patterns of this, um, uh, um, of these um, posterior um, portions of the female's anatomy, the G, H, and I are just variations of a single species. For a tax, for a morphologic, for, for, for a morphologically based taxonomy, you're looking to compare these posteriors compared to four other different species, and it'll take a very highly trained eye to be able to differentiate them based on morphology. So we've had to use other mechanisms to uh, identify them, and I'll come back in a second. So what's the big deal about this path? Uh, what's the big deal about this uh, nematode? Well, here's an example of some tubers of sweet potato, and I want to pick on this tuber the presence of a um, gall or a root knot nematode. You may just be able to pick out on the upper tuber some rough, um, some rugose sorts of lumps uh, on the outer surface of the, on the, on just emerging on the outer edge of the tuber. But the real action happens below the ground. On the left here, we have a healthy cucumber stem. And this is a, but if you compare that to the cucumber stem on the right, all the fine feeder roots have been colonized and the, the nematode turns the fine feeder root into a gall. And it may well be a plant response to try to uh, encase that nematode, that they actually produce this callose tissue, which produces these lumps or these galls. But looking at the infected root system, there's very, very little root hairs there, which can be effective in uptake, nutrient uptake. And that's what 
we see expressed um, above ground. Once you once the root systems are no longer are dysfunctional, you'll see above ground wilting, you'll see reduced yields, and the expression can become more acute when the plant is under a fruit load. Okay. So we've got the, the roots being um, colonized by the root knot nematode, the fine roots becoming no longer functional. Within those galls, the nematode is reproducing. And here is an example of one of those sweet potato tubers. And I've just taken a tangential slice off the edge of that um, raised portion. And you can see in embedded in that gall the uh, mature female nematodes. The one of the real challenges associated with this particular pathogen, uh, what this particular nematode is its broad, broad host range. As we said, we we saw it initially in cucumber. So in the cucurbitaceae, but if we look down the crop host list, we see other representatives of the cucurbitaceae, smooth melon, butternut pumpkin, zucchini, but we also see other taxa. We see um, ginger, so gingerberaceae. We see representative of the solanaceae, capsicum, eggplants, leguminaceae, snake bean, of course, sweet potato, um, convolvulaceae, and then two other representatives of the Solanaceae. With this uh, polyphagous nematode, it's not just satisfied with crop hosts. It can be very uh, cosmopolitan. And we started picking up on weed hosts, which did not display any above ground symptoms, but below ground, we found these uh, galls on Cape Gooseberry, on one of the weedy nightshades, a euphorbia species. So then we've expanded the host range to the euphorbiaceae, another representative buffalo clover of the leguminaceae, crotillaria, again, within the leguminaceae. And then we get an exemplar from the malvaceae, another exemplar from the malvaceae, jute mallow or corcorus. So we're starting to see representations from the cucurbitaceae, solanaceae, zingiberaceae, um, malvaceae, and convolvulaceae. But what I think really surprised us was an, or an ornamental host, again, not displaying any above ground symptoms, but when we looked at the roots of Xanthostemum fruticosus, a, a commercial cultivar, a horticultural commercial cultivar, it too um, had galls. So we've started to move into a native uh, plant family, the Myrtaceae. And we are still going, I think this list will continue to grow as we get more uh, samples from a broader selection of plant hosts. The textbooks tell us there's all, over 400 hosts of Melodogyne enterolobii worldwide. So in order to be able to give us, increase our ability to diagnose these um, nematodes, and given the fact that there are the four parasitic species, are all very, very closely related and morphologically hard to distinguish, we um, were able to leverage off uh, a number of specific um, and conspecific uh, assays, which enabled us to amplify particular parts of the gene region of these organisms to be able to give us the identification. And the way that we do it is we extract these females from the individual galls. And so Sam will pick out an individual female. When you look at the size of that, that's 500 microns is the scale bar there, which is half a millimetre. So Sam's picking off individual females, putting them into lysis buffer 
and that way we know we've got a discrete individual sample and we'll take five replicates from each ghoul to ensure that we have within sample replication. Uh, running blanks and positive uh, controls, we then run the PCR. One, the initial PCR can give us identification to the ge generic level. We send off another Amplicon uh, for um, Sanger sequencing. We then return that sequence, blast that sequence to give us our exact uh, species identification. What this technique also provides us the opportunity to do is to pick up any other Melodogyne species, example, Hapla, um, Incognita, or Arenaria, or Germanica. Um, we've been really fortunate uh, that our staff have received training and also visits from interstate experts to help us improve our identification skills. Um, we are now able to identify some of the pre-border cyst nematodes, and this was done through a, uh, labor a laboratory internship at CSIRO in Canberra, where, of course, in a containment facility, we were able to, to actually work with exotic organisms, but, of course, this was done in a containment facility because we can't work on these organisms, pre-border organisms, uh, outside of a containment facility. We've also been able to be able to diagnose root lesion nematodes, burrowing nematodes, reniform nematodes, needle and spiral nematodes. And as we've been looking uh, since October last year, when we've been looking at the root knot nematodes that we've found, uh, that are, are out there in the productive estate, we're finding that we're getting a lot of Melodogyne enterolobii, but very few Javanica. We have a few incognita and uh, and some and an unknown species of Melodogyne. So this tends to suggest that the uh, the identifications of samples prior to 2000 may have actually underrepresented the presence or uh, underrepresented the presence of Melodogyne enterolobii being present for a lot longer time than we first detected it in 2021-2022. Um, here's a photo of Sam's uh, of another um, parasitic uh, nematode, Pratolinca species. Because the it is not technically feasible to eradicate, the NT is transitioned to long-term management instead. Um, one of our first, uh, it will continue to delimit uh, to understand the host range and the spatial, geographic spatial distribution of this, um, of this nematode. But we also want to be able to start to equate symptoms to the level of infestation. And here's uh, an example of, th exemplar of three um, cucumber plants with varying degrees of, at varying degrees of crop maturity and at varying degrees of uh, root dysfunction. And the only way we can start uh, developing a um, sort of a, a time series of how how plant symptoms develop in relation to root dysfunction will be through monitoring crops from uh, from planting through to pre anthesis anthesis crop load under full crop load to the end of the crop and monitoring levels and uh, degrees of um, galling in relation to crop history. Um, but ultimately, we are not going to be using chemicals as a form of to try to break the cycle. So we have to find another way to develop strategies, example, crop rotations or fallows to be able to reduce inoculum numbers. So bear fallows is an example of um, zucchini on the left at the end of a cropping cycle um, and then monitoring in a host free fallow we could monitor um, nematode numbers over time as we leave that uh, leave those beds fallow another alternative would be to plant an alternative uh, an alternate crop 
for example, something like sorghum, which is a, probably a non-preferred host compared to cucurbitaceae, compared to solanaceae, compared to leguminaceae. And if we are able to establish uh, a, a non-host or a, a host that the, uh, the, the nematode can't reproduce on, then over time, over that wet season, we'll see uh, numbers decrease. Limitations in sort of rain-fed situations, however, mean that putting in a cover crop as an alternate ro uh, rotation can only be started once we have uh, initiating rains. And so far, we're still waiting to be able to start some of these experiments because we're still waiting on rains, which will enable the planting or sowing of an alternate crop. Um, and the, I guess the reason why uh, alternate crops are preferred is because of that broad host range, which includes weed species. So not only are we looking at bare fallows, which would exclude known hosts, but some of those bare fallows may also have to be include the removal of weeds because we've identified that some of these solanaceous weeds, some of the uh, leguminaceous weeds, and even some of the um, cucurbit volunteers can represent ways in which the nematode can continue to thrive. We would like to thank the, the team who have worked at this um, response, Sam, for taking the leadership in relation to the diagnostics and outreach. Um, Sam's been also, also been able to upskill with CSIRO in Canberra. Thank you to um, Drs Mike Hodder and Dan Hustons. Wayne the Brain O'Neill from QDAF interned with us uh, probably Christmas last year and really, really helped us in our ability to be able to detect the nematodes in soil. Um, I'd like to thank the molecular diagnostics team, our surveillance team, and participating household and community gardens and nurseries. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, Stan, sorry, that was really awesome. I'm going to stop the recording now. And